So first, I want to talk a little bit about the home project. We've talked about this um, for the past 18 months or so. And um, you may have heard us initially talk about it as the community-based service evaluation and then the community-based service transformation plan or community-based service redesign. Well, we um, decided here at Health and Human Services that this opportunity of really changing the landscape of the system, you know, it's it's a wonderful opportunity that we're faced with. The system really needs it. A lot of the rules and the way that the our home and community-based waivers are structured today have been the same for decades, and it's time for a refresh. And so we rebranded the project HOME, which is an acronym, because here at Iowa Medicaid and Health and Human Services, we love a good acronym. We can make full sentences with nothing but acronyms. Um, God help everybody around us that doesn't have, have the translator. But we are trying to um, uh, reflect our priorities and our values within this um, project through the brand. And HOME stands for Hope and Opportunity in Many Environments. Really what that gets to is home and community-based services should be something that not only help people um, stay safe and stay well, but also helps people um, lift up to their highest potential and that those services are here to do that. And really that they're here to do that wherever an individual wants to live in their community and however they want to interact in their community. So um, when we started um, our home project, if you, some of you may recall, but I'll back up a little bit for those of you that haven't been part of the conversation um, over the last year and a half. In 2020, um, the American Rescue Plan gave states the opportunity to get have some of their state dollars returned to them. And uh, each state had to submit a plan to the federal government that outlined how they were going to basically reinvest those state dollars. Um, and there were some primary tenants that were um, created as really the guidelines for how these dollars could be spent. And it was to really truly improve quality and access to home and community-based services. So when we took um, a swing at it, we were, these are one-time funds. So we needed to be very conscious about how, how we would create sustainability. We knew the system really needed to get kind of a facelift. Um, and also um, address some of the crises that we're facing, including the workforce challenge. And so we decided to use some of those dollars to invest in doing an evaluation of our home and community-based service um, program. It's not that our staff couldn't do it, although it is much easier when you leverage someone who has national experience and a deep bench, um, we needed to get it done quickly. And if we had kept that internally at the state, it just with m limited number of resources, um, it was just, it was going to take too long to be quite honest. And so we decided to go with Mathematica. They did, took 12 months to do the evaluation. Out of that evaluation came findings and recommendations and those fed into the transformation plan. So um, when we think about the evaluation, there, there are kind of three main things that came out of the evaluation in terms of, of these are kind of general themes of what uh, Mathematica heard and what they saw. So the home and community-based system just isn't working as well for some as it is for others. So when I think specifically, I think about, um, for example, children with autism. 
or another developmental disability that doesn't have a co-occurring intellectual disability, because we don't have a specific autism waiver today, and our waivers are constructed based on truly diagnosis as well as level of care, we have folks that are slipping through the cracks and they're not qualifying on the face of it for certain um, waiver structures. So kids um, who may have an autism diagnosis oftentimes are relying on the health and disability waiver for the services that they need. But guess what? Because those services aren't the same as like services on our intellectual disability or our brain injury waiver, they're not truly getting what they need. They're limited by the service package that is found for the health and disability waiver. So that's one pretty clear gap that I see, but that's one of many. And so just depending on what an individual's diagnosis is, the way that they come into the system and what they end up qualifying for, it might not meet their needs um, as well as someone who is sitting right beside them. Also, um, we looked at the system. There is a lot of money in the system. Um, whether, you know, if you think about like the overarching system, which of course includes Medicaid, Medicaid's a really big part of it, but you also have our, our area agencies on aging, you have the mental health and disability service regions, you have schools. Um, there is a lot of um, money in the system and a lot of resources that are available. But guess what? We don't talk to each other as well as we should or could. And so that is creating unnecessary obstacles and challenges for, for the children, the adults, and the families that we serve. Also, um, you know, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, really services should be aligned at an eligibility level with the individual's need, not just strictly their diagnosis. And so thinking about how to rearrange things so that that would work better. So there are three big um, chunks of the transformation plan for a home that we are working on currently. And when I say working on, you know, I think that individuals have become accustomed to like three and five year plans, or, you know, they just keep perpetually bringing up issues and um, nothing really happens with it. And I want to just say, I get it. I get that there's some skepticism that we're actually going to make this thing happen, but we're going to prove up the fact that we're going to make it happen. And we're doing that every day with, with how we engage individuals with lived experience in all of the planning that we're doing. But to give kind of more, a more precise um, timeline on all of these things that we're working on, like... All, all, most of these things are going to land in 2024, early 2025. So in the next year, we're going to see a lot of big changes. So our goals from home, making it easier for individuals and their families to find the services that they need. We have um, so many doors uh, back in 2012-ish. Um, there was a lot of emphasis for states to create no wrong door. Well, we really leaned into that so excessively that we created so many doors and nothing connected those doors together. There was no lobby or foyer for people to, to kind of come together. And we need to bring that together. We cannot keep asking individuals and their families in times where it's super challenging. People are very stressed times of crisis to go searching on maybe 10 different websites, filling out five different applications. We need to bring all of those things together and make it more um, readily accessible for folks who are in need. Aligning services with people's needs, talked a little bit about that earlier. So we need to make sure that the services that we do set up in a home and community-based structure are accommodating the needs of individuals. And we're not arbitrarily saying 
you qualify for this or you don't qualify for this, even though the need is the same. We need to create a structure so that we can quickly and effectively match needs with services. And we need to create a system that better supports our case managers so that they are equipped and tooled up with all of the services and nuances of Medicaid, but also all of the service availability and things that are accessible um, outside of the Medicaid system so that they can be that single conduit to help connect individuals and their families with, with everything that they need, um, whether it's a home and community-based Medicaid service or it is food assistance or rental assistance. We need to, to skill up our case managers to be able to handle all of those things. So um, I know that wait lists, I saw um, some of the questions that came through and wait lists are an area of concern for everybody. We have pretty significant wait lists. Um, this is not, the way that our waivers are structured helps amplify this issue because people are on more than one wait list. We have 19,000 kind of like waitlist slots right now. A third of those are individuals who are on more than one waitlist. So if we deduplicate the 19 plus thousand, we get down to a smaller number of about 14,000 unduplicated distinct individuals who are waiting to get on a home and community-based service waiver. Well, we don't make good use of that wait time and um, we should. And when I say we, I mean us, like specifically on the Medicaid side. So when an individual comes onto a home and community-based waiver, we don't do any type of screening to make sure that they're on the right waiver um, or waiting in the queue for the right waiver, nor do we screen them to see what they need today. Um, like I said, there are a lot of resources in the system, and we should be connecting folks with the resources that are available while they're in line waiting. And we need to be doing that proactively and not expecting people to cobble those to get together themselves. So we are doing a point in time screening for all 14,000 of the individuals who are on the wait list. Um, we are going to be doing that in, over the course of the next like five-ish months, reaching out to individuals directly, asking them to participate in about a 30-minute screening. The output of that um, will help us determine the need of individuals at the aggregate level who are on a wait list today, but also get case managers connected to help support um, getting individuals what they need right now while they're waiting for an actual waiver slot to come available. Moving forward, after we get through this big 14,000, we will be doing um, the screening as each individual comes onto the wait list. So it'll be, it'll be more of an as people as people stream in rather than doing a big bunch at one time. Um, we're also working on getting um, information from focus groups, as well as working with individuals with lived experience to develop persona um, experiences to figure out like where are the actual tension points in the system so that we can mitigate those as much as possible. We are coming um, out all over the state um, beginning later this month through November to talk to individuals at a local level about what we're doing with the home project, when they should expect things to start changing, um, and get feedback on what we have planned so far. And so we have several locations all across the state. Um, we also will have two virtual options, one in English and one in Spanish. And um, all of these locations, if you click on the link, once you get the, the PowerPoint, it'll give you the location, the date, and the time. 
We're very excited about these, by the way. 